So we can actually solve systems with something called matrices. And we'll talk more about what a matrix is, but for now, we are going to just use the matrix or use matrices to solve systems. And so first off, just in general, a matrix is just a way of organizing information in math. And we can do some operations with that information. We can do operations with the matrix. And it's sort of like a table format of putting information in math. And so one thing to note is size or order or dimension, different ways of talking about a matrix size, is indicated by the number of rows by the number of columns. So for example, how we use this with solving systems of equations, say we have 2x minus 4y is equal to 11, and then we have 3x plus 7y is equal to 32. Well, we put this into a matrix. So we have two equations, which means we're going to have two rows, and we have three terms in each of the equations. So we're going to have three columns. So the first column is going to be the x value or the coefficient on the x. So in the matrix, it's only going to be numbers, no variables, but the numbers are representing coefficients of the system of equations. So the first row is going to be the first equation, so this is 2. And then the second row is going to be the second equation, so the coefficient on x there is 3. And then the next column is going to be the coefficient on y. So in the first equation, this is negative 4. And on the second equation, this is 7. And then now we usually draw a dotted line here to indicate that this is part of the equal sign, it's the other side. And so the equals or the constant coefficient is 11 on the first one and 32 on the other one. And now to solve the system using the matrix, we actually just use the calculator. Now there's some instructions here if you have a graphing calculator. However, a graphing calculator is not required. And so to make this more accessible to everyone, we can solve this using a Desmos calculator. Now this is a new Desmos calculator, which is the Desmos matrix calculator. Let's take a look at it. So you can see here we have the Desmos matrix calculator and it's just at desmos.com slash matrix. Now what we do is we want to create the matrix that we just wrote down. So we click new matrix and we can enter in how many rows and how many columns. So if you take a look at the matrix that we wrote, there were two rows because we had two equations and there were three columns because we had three terms. There was the x term, the y term, and the constant term. So we add three columns. And we just listed out two. And then the next one, you can either click on the screen or use the arrow key, is negative four. And then the next one, the constant was 11. And then on the second equation, the x term or the coefficient of x was three, and the coefficient of y was seven, and then the constant coefficient was 32 and we hit enter and that saves that matrix. So if we hit A, it shows that that is the matrix saved under the variable A. Now what we do is we turn this into what's called a reduced row echelon form or format. And the calculator will do it. We won't go through the process of what happens here, but essentially we can do operations to the rows that will reduce the equation to have just ones in the diagonal and zeros everywhere else of the first two rows in the first two columns. So out of the two rows and two columns here in this little square, the two, negative four, three, seven, it'll turn that into ones going down in the diagonal and zeros across, which will in turn change what the equal signs are or the constant coefficients. So let's hit this R, R, E, F button, and then we just type in our matrix A. And so it changes this into this reduced row echelon form. And if we close parentheses there, we can also turn this into fractions if we hit the fraction button there. Depends on which one you'd rather use, the fractions or the decimals. I like fractions because it's an exact answer, but we could also write it as the decimals. It's not too big of a deal. So this is what we have. We have the small little square over here, the two by two is one zero zero one. And then we have these constant coefficients on the right hand side are actual numbers. So let's see what this looks like in the notes. So we have, remember, this is the reduced row echelon form. So this is the x part, and this is the y part, and this is the 
equal part. So that's always how these are going to be set up. So we have this reduced to be just this one, zero, zero, one. And on the right hand side, this is what we want. This is the 7.9 and 1.2 approximately. So this is the equal sign, the constant coefficient. Now what this is saying, remember we have, this is the, in the first row, the coefficient of x. And then in the second row is the coefficient of y. And the third row is the other side of the equal sign, the constant coefficient. And so this is the first equation. This is the second equation. So what we have here is that this is saying the coefficient on x is 1. The coefficient on y is 0. So there's no y term. So we just have x and then equals 7.9. And then on the second equation, you have the coefficient of x is 0, so there's no x term. And the coefficient of y is 1, so this is just y is equal to, and then on the right-hand side, the constant coefficient is 1.2. And there we go. That's our solution. This is our solution of this system of equations, about 7.9 and 1.2. You can write that as a point. 7.9 is x, and 1.2 is y. And so with some of these systems of equations, we're going to get into three variables, which is very tedious to solve with the algebraic forms or algebraic methods that we talked about previously. And our graphing calculators, or in general, it's just very difficult to graph equations in three variables because that's three dimension. We're no longer on an x, y plane, 2D plane. We're now on an x, y, z plane. So it's like you're graphing in the space that we live in. You can go forwards, backwards, up, down, all those directions that we're used to, which makes it very difficult to find the intersection or find the solution. So let's take a look at some application problems. So just in general with applications, you want to define your variables. You want to write out what the equations are that you have and then solve the solution. Generally, we're going to be using matrices from here on out, but you could do it with graphing, elimination, substitution. And so then it's always nice too to check the answers that you get and see if it all works out. So here we have Greg and Meg have three pieces of string. The total length is 92 inches. The sum of the two longer pieces is 79 inches. The middle piece is twice as long as the shortest piece. And we want to figure out what are the lengths of the three pieces. Now, for a lot of these word problems, you might need to reread it a couple times. I know I always need to. So if you ever need to pause and reread some of these questions to understand what's going on, I suggest pausing and rereading some of these. So first, we want to define our variables. In order to define the variables, we need to figure out what are we looking for? That's what the variables are, the unknown values that we're solving for. So we're trying to find the lengths of the three pieces of strings. Now, it describes the strings as two longer pieces, a middle piece, and a shorter piece. So it's describing it as by its size, the short piece, the middle piece, and the long piece. So the x, we don't want to say the x is the long piece or the x is the middle piece. The x is the length of the long piece or it's the length of the middle piece. So here we write this is the length of long piece. And then y is going to be the length of the middle piece. And z is going to be the length of the short piece. And it does not at all matter which one we label which, as long as we are consistent with our labeling. We, so we could have made x the short piece, y the length of the long piece, and z the length of the middle piece. It doesn't matter as long as we're consistent. So here we have the total length is 92 inches. So that means if you were to lay out all of these pieces of strings together in a row, you get 92 inches long. So that's essentially we're adding the lengths of all the pieces. So adding the lengths of the pieces, this is x plus y plus z is equal to 92. 92 inches, but we'll just leave the units out of it. The next part is the sum, so we're adding two longer pieces, so we're adding two of our variables together, is 79 inches. So remember, going back to translating words into math, remember that total oftentimes means you're adding everything together. Is, whenever you see is, that almost always means equals. So here we're saying the sum, which means we're adding the two longer pieces, so we're adding the two longer pieces, the two longer pieces are x and y, or the lengths are x and y. So we say the sum, which is x plus y, 
is, meaning equals, 79, technically 79 inches. And then the last one that we have is that the middle piece, so the middle piece is representing the variable y, is, which means equals, the middle piece is twice as long as the shortest piece. So we're doing twice as long, so multiplying two times the shortest piece, which is z. So now we have a system of equations here. And we can set up the system of equations in a matrix. So in this matrix, we're going to have three rows because we have three equations. And we're going to have four columns because we're going to have four terms. Look in the first equation we wrote. We have an x term, a y term, a z term, and a constant term. So we have x, y, z, and then the other side of the equal sign, the constant term. And so looking at setting these up, we have the first equation, we'll put that in the first row, x plus y plus z is equal to 92. So writing out the coefficients of the first equation, so this is the first equation here, coefficient of x is 1, coefficient of y is 1, coefficient of z is 1, and the constant coefficient on the other side of the equal sign is 92. And the next one, we have, this is equation 2, so let's label these, this is 1, this is 2, and so in equation 2, which is row 2, we have the coefficient of x is 1, the coefficient of y is 1, but there's no z term. So we say the coefficient of z is 0. And then the constant coefficient on the other side, the equal sign, is 79. And then on the third one here, well, the third one actually isn't in the correct format. It's not all the variables on one side and then the constant term on the other side. So we want to get all the variables to one side. So to get all the variables to one side, you can just subtract the 2z. If we wanted to, we could subtract the y. It, it doesn't matter. We get the same thing at the end of the day. So we get 0 on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, we have a y minus 2z is equal to 0. So this is the third equation that we're going to be using, because now we have it in that correct form. All the variables on one side, and then the constant term on the right-hand side. And so the coefficient of x, well, there's no x, so that's 0. The coefficient of y is 1, and the coefficient of z is negative 2. And the constant coefficient on the right-hand side by itself is 0. So now we use the calculator to get the reduced row echelon form of the equation, and that will give us the solution. So we're going to, the abbreviation for that is RREF. So we're going to use that RREF, say if this is matrix A, we then, in our calculators, do RREF of A. So let's put this into the Desmos matrix calculator. So we're going to select new matrix, and we have three rows, and we have four columns. So we're just going to go down the lines and put in all the values. So we have the first row is 1, 1, 1, 92. The next row is 1, 1, 0, and 79. And then the last row is 0, 1, negative 2, and 0. So we hit enter, and now it saves that matrix. We can check if we hit A. That's the same thing that we just entered. So let's clear that out. And we're going to do RREF, which is the reduced row echelon form. And we just put in A. And so this is the reduced row echelon form, which we see nicely. We get the diagonals in the first three columns, in the first three rows. And this always is how it works out. You should get, you know, the third row is kind of free. That's essentially what the solutions are. So it's always, you know, makes a, a square or a box matrix in the first set of rows and columns. And then the very last column is what the solutions are, the other side of the equal sign. So putting this into the matrix form and looking at the solutions on our notes, the matrix becomes, let's write this out. So remember, this is x, y, z, and then the equals, so the constant. And we have in the first row was 1, 0, 0, and then 53. The second row is 0, 1, 0, and 26. The last row was 0, 0, 1, and 13. Each of the rows are representing an equation, and each of the columns are representing the coefficients of the variables in those equations. So the first row is the equation 
coefficient of x is 1, so we have x. And then the coefficient of y and z are 0, so there's no y and z there. And this is equal to the constant coefficient on the far right column is 53. And then the next equation, where the coefficients of x and z are 0, so that we don't have those in the equation. And the coefficient of y is 1, so this is y is equal to 26, the constant coefficient. And the last equation, you have x, y are 0, so you're just left with coefficient of 1 on z is equal to 13. So this is the solution. These are all in inches. The length of the longest piece is 53 inches. The length of the middle piece is 26 inches. The length of the shortest piece is 13 inches. And we can check that with some of our equations here. We don't have to check them with all, but it is nice to check them with some. So to check them, we would just add up all these values and we should get 92. We could add up the two longest pieces, which is the 53 and 26, and we should get 79. And it should be the case that the middle piece is twice as long as the shortest piece. So that's saying take the shortest piece and multiply that length by two and you get the middle piece. So this actually does satisfy all the equations. And this is a great way of checking your work to see if everything works out and say, hey, did I get the same thing as all these equations that I set up? So now let's take a look at another application example. So let's say Greg and Meg won $200,000 in the lottery, lucky them, and they're intelligent with their money and they want to invest it all. So they decide to invest part of the money in real estate with an annual return of 3%, part of it in a money market account at 2.5% interest, and the remaining part of the money, which is $80,000 less than total invested in the other two options, they put in a CD that pays 1.5%. If their total annual interest on all the money is 4,900, you wanna figure out how much was invested in each option. So definitely pause here, reread that once, twice, maybe thrice, and come back once you sort of have an understanding for what each of these different sentences and all these words mean. So hopefully you reread that. And let's take a look at the different equations that we can set up. First, we want to see what are the different values that we're searching for, or what are we trying to find? We're trying to find how much they invested into each option. So the different options are real estate, the money market account, and putting it into a CD. So instead of using x, y, and z, because that's what we always do, we want to try to mix it up, let's use different variables to represent the different values invested. So let's say r is the money in real estate, or the money invested in real estate. And then the money invested in the money market account, we will say is m. And the last one is the money invested in the CD. So we'll just use C to represent the money in the CD. So they're taking $200,000, yada, yada, lottery, it's a lot of fluff in there. But then they say they're going to invest it all. So they're investing all of that $200,000. So if you take the amount invested in each of these different accounts, the real estate, money market, and CD, they all add up to the $200,000. So that's a first setup is you're investing all of it. So the money in real estate plus the money in the money market account plus the money in the CD is all equal to 200,000. That's all the money that they have to invest. And then the next part that we have is, well, it's actually the part at the end and it says their total annual interest on all the money is $4,900. So the total amount of interest that they get to figure out how much interest they get, remember what it means to get interest is you have, in the example of the real estate, you get 3% return of the amount invested in real estate. So you get 3% of the amount in real estate. Well, the amount in real estate we call R, and we're saying get, to get 3% of, we're multiplying to find 3% of R, you multiply 0.03, because it's in decimal form, by R. So the amount in real estate, the amount of money is 0 0.03 times R. That's the amount of money that you get in interest from real estate is 0 0.03 R. And the amount of money you get from the money market account in interest is 2.5% of the money market account. So 0 0.025 times the amount of money in the money market account. And so 0 0.025 is the amount of money that you get in interest from the money market account. And then lastly, you get 1.5% interest on the CD. And so the amount of money that you get from the CD and in interest is 0 0.015 
times C. So each of these different products here represent the amount of interest you get from each of these investment locations or the, each of these investment vehicles. And if we add all that interest up, we end up with, because it says is, $4,900. And so this is the total, so it's a sum of all the interest, and that sum is $4,900. Now the last part, and this part we kind of have to dissect a little bit. It says the, in the original statement, the remaining part of the money, which is $80,000 less than the total invested in the other two options, they put in a CD that pays 1.5%. So it's already talked about real estate and it's already talked about the money market account. So those are the two options that they talk about first. So the remaining part, the remaining part is the C. So that's what it means when it says the remaining part. So we're saying the remaining part C is, which means equals 80,000 less than the other two options or less than the total invested in the other two options. So 80,000 less than means we're subtracting 80,000 because you're saying 80,000 less. So that means you're taking away 80,000. You're taking away 80,000 from the total, which means sum, invested in the other two options. So you're adding the other two options and you're taking away 80,000 from that. And so we have the other two options is R, which is the amount in real estate, plus the amount in the money market account. So we're adding those two up and taking away 80,000. And that is how much is invested in the CD. So again, we want to put this all into a matrix now that we have all of our equations here. So put into the matrix, we have the different variables are R, M, and C. And then of course the equal sign with the constant coefficient over here. So the first row is the first equation. And it actually doesn't matter what equation we use is the first, second, or third, as long as it's all consistent. And so we have the coefficient of R is one, the coefficient of M is one, the coefficient of C is one, and the coefficient of the constant term is 200,000. So we actually have to push this bar out a little bit. Let's write out 200,000. And the next equation, is right here. So this is the interest equation. The coefficient of R is 0 0.03. The coefficient of M is 0 0.025. The coefficient of C is 0 0.015. And this is all equal to on the other side of the equation is the constant coefficient 4,900. Now with the third one here, again, we have a big mishmash. We have C on one side of the equation by itself. We have R and M on the other side of the equation, and then also the constant. So it's, it's all mixed up. So we want to get all of the variables on one side, and we wanna get the constant coefficient, the constant term without a variable on the other side. So it's probably easiest to just move the C to the right and the negative 80,000 to the left. So let's subtract C, and that means we have to do it on both sides. So then that adds to zero on the left. And on the right-hand side, we wanna move the negative 80,000 to, to the other side. And so we add 80,000, on the right hand side and that adds to zero. And so that means we have to add 80,000 on the other side. And so what we have left over here is 80,000 on the left is equal to, well, it's gonna be negative C. Um, let's try to keep it in the same order. So we the original order is R then M then C. So this is R plus M and then minus C. And so now we have all the variables on one side and, and the constant term on the other side. It's okay that it is, you know, one's on the left and one's on the right. It still means the same thing. Equality doesn't matter if you rewrite the order. X equals Y is the same as Y equals X. So let's write out the coefficients that we have. The coefficient on R is one. And this is the third equation. The coefficient on M is one. The coefficient on C is negative one. And the constant coefficient is 80,000. Now we put this into the RREF form. So in the calculator, if we call this matrix A, we do RREF of A. So let's take a look in the Desmos calculator. So we're doing a new matrix and we have, again, three rows because three equations and four columns because we have four terms, the X, well, in this case, the R, M, and C, and then the constant term. So just going across the row by row, we have one, then one, 
one and 200,000. And then continuing on to the second row, we have 0 0.03, 0 0.025, 0 0.015, 0 0.015, and then 4,900. And the last row, we have one, one, negative one, and 80,000. We hit enter. And now we set this up using the RREF, and we end up with RREF of A, that's the matrix we just created, and we get this reduced row echelon form. And it's nice because it's all, you know, ones in the diagonal on the left-hand side here, and then zeros everywhere else, and then we have the equal sign, uh, the last column. So let's write out the solution that we got here. So we have the R, M, C, and then the other side of the equal sign. So in the first row, the first equation, we had this is 1, 0, 0, and the second equation, the second row, and 100,000. And then the second row, the second equation, we have this is 0, 1, 0, and 40,000. And then the third row, the third equation is 0, 0, 1, and 60,000. And so remember what each of these represent. This is an equation in the first row where the coefficient of r is 1 and the coefficient of the rest of them is 0. So this is r is equal to, on the right-hand side, that constant coefficient is 100,000. And this is money, so we should put a dollar sign on that. And the second equation, we have the coefficient of m is 1 and the coefficient of the rest of them is 0. So this is m is equal to 40,000. And in the third row, the last equation, the coefficient of C is 1, and then on the rest of them is 0. So we have C is equal to, that constant coefficient is 60,000. So this is the solution here, where remember the R represents the money in real estate. The M is the money market. And then the C is the CD. Now, in all these examples, we had this nicely where it went to the reduced row echelon form and we got all ones in the diagonal and zeros. And so sometimes that's not the case and we have to understand how to interpret these results. And so here on this one, we have these three equations. So let's write this out. The first column is going to be X, the next one's Y, the next one's Z, and then we have the equal sign is the constant coefficient. And so to write this out, the first equation, the coefficients are 1, negative 2, 3, and 3. The second equation, the coefficients are 5, negative 9, 4, and 2. The third equation, the coefficients are 2, negative 4, 6, and negative 1. If we use the RREF in the calculator, we end up with the equation in the first row, 1, 0, negative 19, and then 0. So this is x, y, z, and then the constant coefficient. And then on the next one, we end up with 0, 1, 11, 0. And then on the last one, we end up with 0, 0, 0, and 1. So what ends up happening here is that we have this first equation, this first row is the coefficient on x is 1, the coefficient on y is 0, the coefficient on z is negative 19. So this is x minus 19z is equal to the constant coefficient of 0. On the second row here, we have the coefficient of y is 1, so this is y, the coefficient of z is 11, so this is y plus 11z is equal to 0. And the last one here, the coefficient on all of the variables are 0, so we have 0 on the left-hand side, and this is equal to the constant coefficient, which is 1. Now notice here, we end up with 0 is equal to 1. 0 is equal to 1. Well, 0 is not equal to 1. 0 is never equal to 1. So because you have this inconsistency here, then we say that there's no solution because 0 is not equal to 1. There's no solution. Sometimes you might hear the expression, it's dependent or inconsistent. So that's one way of getting something a little messed up. There's another way of getting something a little messed up is this other situation is where we have, again, this is x, y, z, and then the other side, the equal sign. 
And so in the first row, the first equation, we have the coefficient of x is 1, then 2, then 2, then 9. And the next one is 1, 3, negative 4, and 5. The last one is 2, 5, negative 2, and 14. So doing the RREF in the calculator, we have the result is 1, 0, 14, and then the constant coefficient is 17. So remember, this is x, y, z, and then equals. And so we have the second one. The result is 0, 1, negative 6, and negative 4. And I invite you and I encourage you to try to get these RREF forms in your own calculator and see if you get the same thing out. And the last row here is all zeros across the board. And so rewriting these using the equations, the first equation, the coefficient of x is 1, so this is x. And then the coefficient of z is 14, so x plus 14z is equal to 17. No problem so far, we still got variables. The second equation, the coefficient of y is 1, so we got y and the coefficient of z is negative 6, so minus 6z is equal to negative 4. And the last one, it's all zeros on the left and all zeros on the right, so you have 0 equals 0. Which 0 equals 0, well that is always true. 0 is always equal to 0. So what that means is that there are infinitely many solutions.